Welcome to section 14 of immunology. In this section, we'll be discussing vaccinations. Let's get started. Now, as an overview, it's important to recognize that the ideal vaccine would maximize immunologic memory while minimizing side effects, including infection. So we'll look at this conceptually, comparing a good vaccine to a better vaccine and the best vaccine. So a good vaccine would form memory B cells. A better vaccine forms memory B cells and memory T helper cells, but the best vaccine would form memory B cells, memory T helper cells, and memory cytotoxic T cells. This table lists what you need to know about vaccines, and it's best to think of vaccines in these three broad categories, live or attenuated vaccines, killed or inactivated vaccines, and finally, subunit vaccines. Let's dive into the live or attenuated vaccines. Included in this vaccine is a whole live pathogen, and since it's alive, it can replicate. However, the virulence factors have been removed. Now these next two points can often be confusing for students, but after this explanation, you'll understand what's going on. This type of vaccine can induce a humoral response as well as a cellular response. Let's clarify these terms on a new slide. This slide will help us understand humoral versus cellular immunity. Hopefully by now you know that the immune system is comprised of innate and adaptive responses. As you may recall from section two, acute inflammation is mediated by the innate arm of the immune system. This includes things like neutrophils, complement, and mast cells. On the other hand, much of chronic inflammation is mediated by the adaptive arm of the immune system. So when we're discussing humoral and cellular immunity, it's best to think specifically of adaptive immunity. So to put this another way, the adaptive immune system includes humoral and cellular responses. The humoral immune system is made of helper T cells as well as the interleukins that they produce. Humoral response also includes B cells and the antibodies they produce. And since B cells and helper T cells are involved, then when humoral immunity is activated, they will form memory helper T cells and memory B cells. Now let's focus on cellular immunity. This refers primarily to cytotoxic T cells, and these work by directly killing infected cells. And because cytotoxic T cells are involved, then when cellular immunity is activated, memory cytotoxic T cells will be formed. Now this image shows a lymph node, and we can see in the center a dendritic cell. As we discussed in the chronic inflammation video, dendritic cells will present antigens to naive helper T cells, and they do this using MHC class two. So this will activate the helper T cells, which then go on to perform three important roles. If you move to the left, we can see that one of those roles is to release interleukins. And as mentioned in previous lectures, the interleukins that will be released by the T helper cell really depends on the T helper cell subtype. For example, Th1 versus Th2. And these interleukins can enter the blood and from there exert their effect. That's the first thing T helper cells do when they're activated. The second thing they do is form a memory helper cell. The third thing is that they can activate B cells. You can see an activated B cell here, which then forms a memory B cell and then a plasma cell. And it's the plasma cell that releases antibodies. So what I've shown up here describes the humoral response. The term humoral or humor refers to the blood or specifically the proteins that travel through the blood. For example, the antibodies and the interleukins. So when you think of humoral immunity, think of interleukins from helper T cells and antibodies from B cells. Now let's move down and discuss cellular immunity. So let's look again at the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell will present antigens to the naive cytotoxic T cell, which you can see here. And it does this using MHC class one. So once we get this activated cytotoxic T cell, it will form a memory cytotoxic T cell which will make the cellular response to the same pathogen much quicker in the future. The cytotoxic T cell will then travel to the inflamed tissue, identify the infected cell, and induce apoptosis. And now that we've discussed the cellular response, which is basically cytotoxic T cell activity, I want to highlight one important feature about MHC class one. You've learned from section 11 that dendritic cells will activate T cells using MHC class two for helper T cells, and MHC class one for cytotoxic T cells. But this brings us to an important concept called cross-presentation, and it involves MHC class one. So as you may recall, MHC class one is present on all nucleated cells, and infected cells will present antigens on their MHC class one. This will mark that cell for killing. In other words, the cytotoxic T cell will recognize this MHC class one and then mark the cell for killing. However, this interaction does not activate naive cytotoxic T cells. So this brings us to why dendritic cells are so important. If the infection includes dendritic cells, those dendritic cells can then present on MHC class one. This is called cross-presentation. 
and dendritic cells can do something that none of the other cells in the body can do, and that is cause cytotoxic T cell activation. So here are two assumptions you need to make. Assumption one, dendritic cells are infected when they activate naive cytotoxic T cells, which again occurs in the lymph node. Assumption number two, only live vaccines can infect dendritic cells and therefore cause a cellular response, which again is basically cytotoxic T cell activation. So going back to this image, you can see the dendritic cell and it's safe to assume that it will use MHC class two to activate naive helper T cells. And it's also safe to assume that it will use its MHC class one to activate naive cytotoxic T cells. And that's just a safe assumption to make all the time. However, when it comes to vaccines specifically, you need to recognize that the pathogen in the vaccine must be alive. For example, a live vaccine is able to infect the dendritic cell and cause antigen processing and allow it to activate naive cytotoxic T cells on the MHC class one. However, a killed vaccine would not infect the dendritic cell and therefore it would not do antigen processing and it would not do MHC class one presentation and would not activate the naive cytotoxic T cell, which means a killed vaccine cannot induce a cellular response. And this idea is summarized right here. So again, live vaccines can infect the dendritic cell so it can cause a cellular response, which means that there will be memory cytotoxic T cells formed. And obviously it will form a humoral response because of that MHC class two activation of T helper cells, which will lead to the formation of memory T helper cells and memory B cells. So live vaccines lead to lots of immunologic memory, which is very important with the vaccine. Now here are some high yield examples of live vaccines. There's adenovirus, salmonella typhi, the oral form, the polio vaccine, specifically the Sabin form, the varicella vaccine, smallpox vaccine, BCG vaccine, which is the TB vaccine. You can learn more about that in our microbiology chapter. Also the influenza vaccine, specifically the intranasal form. Also the yellow fever vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, MMR. And finally, the rotavirus vaccine. Knowing that each one of these vaccines includes a live virus is very high yield. For this reason, we have ensured that each of our microbiology videos covering these pathogens provides a memory hook to help you remember that they are included as a live vaccine. For the most part, our symbol for this is a sign that reads live animals and included that into the story. For example, in yellow fever, there is a live animal sign pointing to a trapped monkey, the monkey which is central to the story. Now there are some important notes to keep in mind with live vaccines. Basically, you need to recognize that there's an unlikely possibility that the pathogen can mutate and acquire a virulence factor, which means that it can actually cause an infection that will harm the patient. Remember, with live attenuated vaccines, we're assuming that it's live, but the virulence factors have been removed. But what I'm saying here is that it can potentially regain a virulence factor and cause infection. So why does this matter? Well, and this fact matters because there are certain populations in which a live vaccine is contraindicated because this potential mutation causing an infection can be so devastating. Those populations include immunodeficient patients and pregnant patients. Now let's discuss killed or inactivated vaccines. These include the whole pathogen, just like live vaccines, but they're killed. And these vaccines induce a humoral response, which means the patient will form memory T helper cells and memory B cells. However, it will not form a cellular response. Recall from this image that the pathogen must be living and able to infect the dendritic cell, at least in order for the dendritic cell to present proteins on MHC class one and therefore activate the cytotoxic T cell. But even though a killed vaccine can't do any of this and not do a cellular response, the dendritic cell can still phagocytose the pathogen and present it on MHC class two, therefore activating naive T helper cells. Therefore, dendritic cells can form memory T cells and memory B cells. They just can't form memory cytotoxic T cells. Some examples of killed vaccines include the rabies vaccine, the influenza vaccine, specifically the intramuscular injected form, and the polio vaccine, specifically the SALK form, and the hepatitis A vaccine, and salmonella typhi, the intramuscular form. So the typhoid vaccine. And there's one note that you need to remember about killed vaccines and it's the fact that they require a booster. Now, the fact that they require a booster is logical. After all, we can see that it didn't even induce a cellular response. In fact, only memory T helper cells and memory B cells were formed. And since the memory isn't as good, they're going to eventually require a booster. Another reason why they require a booster is the fact that they weren't actually fighting off a real living organism. 
like they would have with a live vaccine. So the immune response to the vaccine is just not nearly as dramatic. So eventually they're going to require a booster. Now let's discuss the last category, the subunit vaccines. Subunits are selected antigens from a killed pathogen. Interestingly, recombinant DNA technology is often used to procure only the desired antigen. For example, giving yeast DNA and having them develop the appropriate hepatitis B surface antigen, which can then be used for the hepatitis B vaccine. And these subunits will induce a humoral response. These subunits can take the form of polysaccharides, proteins, or toxoids. And toxoids in all reality are proteins, but I just want to separate them categorically to help you understand the specific details you need to know about toxoids. Okay, before I said that with a humoral response, there will eventually be memory helper T cells and memory B cells, which I've shown up above with live attenuated vaccine, as well as the killed vaccine. However, some antigens will not form memory helper T cells. For example, polysaccharides. That's because polysaccharides induce a T cell independent activation of B cells. And this causes a formation of memory B cells only. And the only antibodies that can be secreted this way are the IgM class. So going back to this image, we see the dendritic cell and it can present on MHC class two. However, it must be a protein. So that's true whenever you think of these MHC class one or two proteins. The antigen that is presented on those MHC class one or two are always proteins. They need to be proteins. So with a purely polysaccharide vaccine, this interaction right here will not take place. So helper T cells will not become activated. However, B cells can become activated and they do this through a T cell independent mechanism. This image shows T cell independent activation of B cells and was introduced in section 13 when discussing B cell activation. Here you can see a B cell and we have a bacterium. There's also several polysaccharide antigens attached to that bacterium. These antigens can cause proliferation as normal and differentiation of the B cell into a plasma cell. However, that plasma cell can only secrete IgM antibodies. And that's because through this type of activation, there's no class switching. Do you remember what cells need to be activated in order for class switching to occur? That would be the helper T cells. Helper T cells are needed to cause class switching and lead to the formation of IgA, IgE, or IgG antibodies. So again, purely polysaccharide vaccines induce the formation of memory B cells only, and then only IgM antibodies can be produced. Now let's move on to a more effective antigen, the proteins. Proteins cause T cell dependent activation of B cells. This means that memory B cells are formed and memory T helper cells are formed. And since activated helper T cells are around, class switching can occur and all classes of antibodies can be produced. So what do you know so far about subunit vaccines? Well, protein antigens induce a more advantageous immune response than purely polysaccharide vaccines. And again, that's because the antigen that needs to be on MHC class two in order to activate T helper cells is a protein, not polysaccharide. And again, the reason the protein antigens are more advantageous as vaccines is because polysaccharide antigens cannot be presented on MHC molecules, and therefore they can't induce a T cell response, so they're weaker. Now let's discuss the last type of antigen, the toxoids. Toxoids simply refers to denatured bacterial exotoxin. I wanna emphasize that it's exotoxins we're dealing with here. You may recall from our microbiology fundamentals chapter that bacteria have exotoxins and endotoxins. There's really only one endotoxin, and that's lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. And as the name tells you, that's not a protein. Whereas all exotoxins are proteins. So toxoids are proteins. So everything we said about proteins is true for toxoids. In other words, toxoids cause T cell dependent activation of B cells. So memory B cells are formed and memory T helper cells are formed. And just to clarify some definitions, a toxin is harmful, a toxoid is harmless. The next concept will tie together the ideas of subunit vaccines. Antigens, meaning polysaccharides or proteins, may be combined with another substance to increase the immune response. And you should assume that nearly every vaccine has been combined in some way. In other words, we know that polysaccharides aren't that helpful, but if you combine them and attach them to a protein, you can induce a stronger response and therefore get those memory T helper cells. So again, assume nearly every vaccine has been combined in some way. And below are the two main substances that can be combined with the vaccine. Those are protein conjugates and adjuvants, for example, aluminum. Now, protein conjugates are useful because they can be combined with polysaccharides. This means that a polysaccharide, when combined with a protein conjugate, can be presented on MHC class 2, 
and therefore activate the helper T cell and ultimately induce the formation of a memory helper T cell, in addition to forming memory B cells. So again, a polysaccharide, when combined with a protein, can be presented on MHC class 2, which means combining a vaccine in this way can lead to the formation of memory T helper cells and memory B cells. Now, adjuvants, such as aluminum-based compounds, have a variety of mechanisms that maximize an immune response to a vaccine. And we're still learning about some of those mechanisms. But here's the way that I like to think about adjuvants. They increase toll-like receptor recognition, which means there's increased phagocytosis, which means there's more dendritic cell presentation, which means there's more memory helper T cell formation and more memory B cell formation. This image demonstrates a macrophage stimulating a helper T cell. And this was discussed in section 8 of this chapter. And although this is a macrophage, these principles equally apply to dendritic cells. Right now, I only want you to focus on one thing, this receptor at the top. This is CD14, which is an example of a toll-like receptor. Aluminum adjuvants make it easier for toll-like receptors, such as this one, to bind to pathogenic antigens. So more of this binding means more phagocytosis, more oxygen-independent killing, more antigen presentation, and more T-cell activation. So that's the simple way to think of adjuvants. Now there are several examples of subunit vaccines. Again, assume nearly every vaccine has been combined with a protein conjugate or an adjuvant in some way. For example, strep pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza type B, and Neisseria meningitidis are all encapsulated organisms, so developing immunity against capsular polysaccharides is imperative for a useful vaccine. And each one of these polysaccharides in a vaccine are combined with a protein conjugate. And there are other antigens which are themselves proteins. For example, included in the hepatitis B vaccine is the surface antigen, which is a protein. And being a protein, it doesn't rely on another protein conjugate. Same goes for the HPV vaccine, which includes capsid proteins from several serotypes, including HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18. And although the antigens are proteins, most of these vaccines are combined with an adjuvant. And this is done to maximize the immune response. Now let's move on to the toxoid examples. Toxoids are also proteins. The prime example of a toxoid vaccination is the DTaP. The capital D stands for the diphtheria toxoid. The T stands for the tetanus toxoid. And the lowercase a and capital P stand for acellular pertussis. In other words, there's a lot of protein in this vaccine to stimulate a strong immune response. Of note is the fact that subunit vaccines require booster shots. This is because the immune response from a subunit vaccine wasn't dramatic enough to give the patient lifelong immunity. This makes sense because the patient wasn't actually infected with a living pathogen, so the immune response wasn't dramatic enough. Also, they didn't form any memory cytotoxic T cells. Remember, memory cytotoxic T cells only occur in live vaccines because they're able to induce a cellular response. Again, by infecting the dendritic cell. Lastly, subunit vaccines are pretty expensive to make. And that's understandable, considering that vaccine developers need to procure only selected antigens. For example, using recombinant DNA technology, which can be expensive. Now that we've covered vaccinations, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A pharmaceutical company is attempting to create a novel vaccine that targets the polysaccharides on the capsule of E. coli. Their goal is to avoid using conjugate proteins or adjuvants in their vaccine formulation. If the vaccine works, what type of immunologic memory should be expected? Now recall the three broad categories of vaccines. Live vaccines, killed vaccines, and subunit vaccines. And what type of vaccine are we dealing with here in this question? A subunit vaccine. After all, they're targeting only the polysaccharides on the pathogen. Whereas live and killed vaccines include the whole pathogen. Also remember what types of memory can be induced by vaccines. These include memory B cells, memory helper T cells, and memory cytotoxic T cells. Now, which is the only vaccine category that can induce the formation of memory cytotoxic T cells? That would be live vaccines. So, in our polysaccharide-only vaccine, we would not be expecting memory cytotoxic T cells. And recall from this table that polysaccharides induce a T cell independent activation of B cells, which means they form memory B cells only. And the question stem is asking us to assume protein conjugates and adjuvants are not used. Therefore, we do not expect helper T cell formation or the formation of memory helper T cells. So what type of immunologic memory do we expect with this subunit vaccine? That would be memory B cells only. And that concludes this section.